Gertrude Spencer, manager of fellowship programs here in the Endowment for Democracy. On behalf of NED's International Forum for Democratic Studies, I am delighted to welcome everyone to today's presentation, Strengthening Democracy in Bangladesh Through Women's Empowerment in Trade Unions, featuring Radio Democracy Fellow Lily Zong. We are delighted to have with us as discussant today Tim Ryan, Program Director for Asia at the Solidarity Center. As many of you may know, the Reagan for Cell Democracy Fellows Program is an international exchange program funded by the U.S. Congress to host some of the world's most dedicated democracy activists, scholars, and journalists to conduct independent research and produce projects here at NED. Now, in our 14th year, the program has hosted more than 240 fellows from over 90 countries since our founding in 2001. Within this remarkable group in Bangladesh. The horrors of the Persian Fashion Fire Factory, Factory Fire, and the Ram Factory Collapse shocked the world into noticing Bangladesh's industry also known by the acronym RMG industry, and the four million Bangladeshis who earn their livelihood through it. While many well-intentioned initiatives arose in response to these tragedies, tragedies, such efforts are only part of the solution. Without full awareness of their rights and responsive representation, factory workers are left without effective tools for self-determination. For a workforce that is more than 85% female, this requires overcoming social and industrial pressures to build gender-inclusive trade unions. In her presentation, Lily will analyze the situation of workers in Bangladesh's RMG sector in the years following Rana Plaza, with a particular focus on women in the workforce. She will offer recommendations to promote the sector's sustainable development through democracy and empowerment of working women. Lily is Senior Program Officer with the Dhaka Office of the Solidarity Center, where she supports workers, trade unions, and federations in the export processing zones, the ready-made garment industry, and the shrimp and fish processing industry. As Senior Program Officer, trainings on gender equality, women's leadership, fire safety, and trade union management, and produces publications on Along with other Solidarity Center staff, she assisted Gaudish Independent Garment Workers Union Federation, a workers' organization that operates under female leadership, also assisted shrimp workers to form trade unions in their industry. During her fellowship, she's been working on a set of gender policy guidelines for advancing women's leadership among trade unions within the industry. Timothy Ryan is Program Director for Asia at the Solidarity Center here in DC, where he's been based since 2005. Prior to that, he spent eight years in Asia as the Solidarity Center's field representative in Sri Lanka and Indonesia. He has published extensively and delivered expert testimony on and currently serves on the board of the world's preeminent child labor organization, the Global March Against Child Labor, based in New Delhi. We'll now turn the floor over to Lily, who will speak for approximately 25 minutes, followed by Tim, who will speak for about 10. For those of you on Twitter, you can follow this conversation and contribute to the hashtag NEDEvents or by following the forum at Think Democracy and the endowment at NE Democracy. If you haven't already done so, please join me in silencing your cell phones. Let me take this opportunity to thank the many staff members involved in today's event, most especially Elise Alexander, for her vital assistance in preparing this talk. Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for joining us today. I would like to thank National Endowment for giving us this opportunity. I respectfully would like to thank Mr. Carl Garshman, President of NEED, 
Dr. Sally Blair, Senior Art Director, Chris Walker, Jaxis Spencer, Melissa, Ashley, and Marlena. I especially would like to thank the Angels Research Associates, Ellis Alexander, Ihan Heiner, and others who assisted us every day in with my sincere gratitude, I thank Solidarity Center and especially Tim Ryan for encouraging and assisting me in all through the way. I feel honored to have him here today. I express my regards and thanks to our government, women leaders and garment workers. My presentation will include democracy in the ready-made garment industry, some specific developments after Tazrin fire and Rana Plaza building collapse, reality, concerns, and challenges. I will also make some suggestions and recommendations. Factory fire, because of electrical problem, has always been a problem in Bangladesh. 23 workers died in a fire incident at Choudhury Nitwar in 2004, 62 died at KTS in 2006, died Hamim factory in 2011, 112 workers died at Tazrin Fashions on November 24, 2012. There is no way for us to fully understand the feelings when a living person dies from fire and we do not want to. Five months later and 10 miles away, the garment factory building collapsed. 1,129 workers died, 2,500 were injured, and people remain missing. Five different garment were for international I went there immediately. I cannot express full experience and feelings. Injured workers were immediately taken to the nearest hospital. Dead bodies were brought constantly for families to identify and receive. People, including government, community, co-workers, and other work together carefully to save workers. However, the collapse of an eight-story building where more than 5,000 workers worked was a huge disaster and needed reasonable time. The survivors said that they saw cracks in the supporting columns of the building on April 23rd and became very scared. And, in, and one engineer was brought who declared the building unsafe. Workers were instructed to leave the building and they did that. Next morning, the building was declared safe and workers were instructed to work in the building. After a few minutes, the building collapsed. When the electricity went off and the generator started up. It collapsed, making a huge shaking, vibration and terrible loud sound. There was no union either in Rana Plaza or in Tazrin fashion. Bangladesh ready-made garment industry made a rapid growth from 50 factories in 1980s to 5,000 plus factories in 2015. Employs approximately 4 million workers of whom 85% are women. 24 billion industry and the second largest volume exporter of garments in the world. 
The industry represents 80% of the country's export earnings and became a model giving women workers earning opportunity. United States and the European Union are the largest purchaser of Bangladeshi made garments. Development of union in the ready-made garment sector had overcome challenges several times because of several things, trade union activities made difficulties because of changes of government, imposed martial law, and the state of emergency. However, trade union, workers' organization, civil society, and NGOs had been talking to government and businessmen and brands regarding worker rights, fire and safety issues, etc. Accordingly, government has been implementing some initiatives. Tazrin Fire and Rana Plaza collapse made a momentum. After Tazrin Fire and Rana Plaza collapse, the leading union federations in the garment sector started seriously union organizing. Solidarity Center worked with these federations and factory workers and trained them union organizing, gender equality and women leadership building, negotiation and collective bargaining, fire and building safety, paralegal training, etc. 300 plant level union were registered with over 60% women leadership. Over 30 collective bargaining agreements were signed between the management and the unions. These agreements solved issues of reinstatement of union leaders, payment of wages, maternity benefit, fire and building safety issues, and many other workplace and employment issues. Bangladesh Labor Act 2006 also was amended to be more worker friendly, including safety measures and inclusion of women in the Trade Union Executive Committee. Some other initiatives took place in Bangladesh at the same time. A court on fire and building safety, which is a five year independent legally binding agreement. Over 200 global garment brands and retailers and two global unions, Industrial Global Union and Uni Global Union and their national garment sector affiliates signed an agreement to make garment industry safe. Because of having unions, brands and retailers, Accord has been successful in making sure that safety problems are identified, get fixed, and stay fixed. Some factories were temporarily closed because of remediation. Some factories were permanently closed because of severe unsafe condition. Unions worked with the workers and accord to make sure workers are paid and get severance payment in some in such cases. Alliance for Bangladesh Workers Safety, which is an initiative by a group of North American apparel companies, retailers, and brands. Also, a national tripartite plan of action for fire and building safety and inspection by the government. Both Accord and Alliance inspected approximately 2,100 factories and identified 1,000 issues in the past period of their The Garment Factory Owners Association, BGMEA, has been doing monitoring on fire and building safety standards. Monthly minimum wage was raised for garment workers from Taka 3000 to Taka 5300. Government also launched a helpline. Workers 
filed case against Rana Plaza Authority with the assistance of the Solidarity Center. Police also filed case for deaths and violation of building rules and submitted charge sheet against 42 persons, including the building owner. Legal protections for workers and women in Bangladesh under the Constitution, national law, and national labor standards. Citizens are equal and entitled to equal protection and have equal rights in all spheres of state and public life under the Constitution of Bangladesh. Bangladesh Labor Act 2006 grants rights of union organization, registration, negotiation, and collective bargaining. International labor standards also grant rights of freedom of association, collective bargaining, and non-discrimination. The need is proper implementation and enforcement. With all these initiatives, Bangladesh remit garment industry have been making progress. Still, there are concerns and challenges. Generalist system of preference was suspended 2013. Decline in union registration giving approval since the end of 2014. From 2013 to now, about 500 factories workers became, became organized to form union. However, 300 got registration. 90 of those are no longer active. These new initiatives, such as ACCORD, have a specific five-year timeline. Moreover, it has not played a supportive role in anti-union activities building work, women voice, and women leadership. Question is that, what is the guarantee for sustainable development, and who will continue such progress after five years? Specific inequalities in employment in the RMG sector. The industry is based on women. However, women works mainly as machine operators and helpers. Job is just a paycheck. Men occupy higher positions, higher salary, supervisor, and manager. Women is still viewed as cheap labor, and quiet group, powerless group, cannot stand for their rights. Women issues are also sidelined in the union collective bargaining. Recently, unsafe migration and being increased significantly. UNHCR reported 53,000 documented Bangladeshi workers went to Malaysia and Thailand by sea during the period from November 2014. A number of newspapers reported that more than 2,500 people were floating on the Bay of Bengal and Andaman Sea. In the last three months, about 200 mass graves have been found in Malaysia and Thailand. There are challenges in the ready-made garment industry. I believe that challenges to opportunity. Considering the progress and challenges, I would like to make up and recommendations. Review of national and international framework and initiatives. Mainstreaming gender policy in the employment of the RMG sector. Bangladesh has achieved some wonderful progresses in employment women, including increasing girls in school, reducing child mortality, reducing violence against women, promoting mortality, and many more. Bangladesh has been as assisting and encouraging women to take their presence in business and government service. These type of developments need to be focused in the garment sector, particularly in the employment policy. A zero tolerance policy by the government, brands, retailers, and buyers towards union activities. 
continuous monitoring of subcontracting factories, especially where brands produce their garments. Financial support for union organizing training, gender equality training, and women leadership building program. After Tazrin fire and Rana Plaza collapse, good number of funds has been given to Bangladesh from international donor agencies, brands, retailers, and others. Still, a very small portion of the total amount is going to assist workers to educate them organizing rights, women rights, and national and international labor standards. In many cases, for taking organizing activities, women workers face harassment. Firstly, in their family, firstly, sorry, firstly, in their factory management, and secondly, in their family, by their husbands, parents, and other family members. Therefore, there is a need to make awareness among the community people to support women workers when they stand for their rights. I believe that for upholding long-term sustainable development, there is a strong need of functional factory-level unions, women leadership, and continuous monitoring by the union. They know their situation best. Workers do not see inspectors every day in their workplace. They do not see brand representatives every day in their workplace. They do not contact government people every day. They see and they meet union leaders who work in the same factory and who know their situation best. I believe this is the time to focus on women government workers to safeguard democracy and healthy working conditions in the ready-made garment sector of Bangladesh. This is a common frame where we all can contribute. Brands and retailers, as they put order, business, they care their goodwill, and they already are involved in remediation and improvements work. Businessmen, as they run business, government is committed in advancing women and gender equality, and needs to focus on to promote development work considering women issues. And we, we have feelings for Bangladeshi women garment workers. We are all advocates. We care. We wear. And we will wear clothing made in Bangladesh. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you, Lily, for that excellent overview of the situation within the RMG industry and the focus on women in particular, and for your insightful recommendations. Let us now turn over to Tim Ryan for his comments. Hello, everybody. Good afternoon and uh, welcome. It's a pleasure to be here um, and would like to thank the uh, both for the fellowship uh, that has been extended to, to Lilly and the opportunity to be, to be a part of this program. The Solidarity Center uh, values its relationship to the NED and NED's commitment to promoting democracy in all its forms, including the rights of workers around the world. Um, for more than 15 years and worked with her and, and engaged with her over that time, and of garment workers in Bangladesh is one of the real litmus tests in Asia for the rights not only of workers in general, but women workers in particular. And while it's work that the Solidarity Center does in many other countries, the challenges in Bangladesh are particularly acute. You heard a number of the statistics 
that uh, were uh, that Lily presented in her in her presentation, which are pretty staggering, when you think about the amount of garment uh, Bangladesh industry produces for consumption worldwide, that it's 80 percent of their foreign exchange, which is a critical sort of backbone of the economy, and it's the millions of women garment workers that are the backbone of, of that uh, important piece of development for the Bangladesh economy. Um, so I wanted to make a few observations um, about Lily's work and presentation and how this is important to promoting democracy in Bangladesh. Um, first of all, all the, the situation in Bangladesh that Lily has described, the status of women, um, legal or gaps in those women, women workers have, the fact of the Tazreen and Rana Plaza disasters, the impact of using US trade law, such as the generalized system of preferences, which affects tariff benefits uh, on goods imported from developing countries to the United States, um, the international opprobrium of the Bangladesh government and companies that has come as a result of these disasters and revelations of the treatment of workers in Bangladesh, and pressure on the international brands. These are all key levers to creating the political space for unions to organize relatively bargain. Um, I think I just want to say that in, in, the, in the field of labor, uh, it's a solidarity center and my colleagues around the world and, and another organization has been working for many years. We see this as a long-term prospect to improving workers' lives. Um, I think it's pretty stunning to think that of the last four, or the four biggest, I should say, industrial disasters in the garment sector uh, in the last hundred years, three have taken place since 2012. The Ali factory fire in Karachi, the Tazreen fire in Bangladesh, and the Rana Plaza building collapse. The worst disaster before that was the 19 shirtwaist factory fire in New York City, which also created the space for the International Environment Workers Union to form. So this is a, this is a situation that sort of presents two, two, uh, two thoughts here. One is these tragedies, bad as they are and horrible as they are, are the opportunities to highlight the causes and the, uh, and the issues that they're fighting for. And secondly, it's an opportunity to try to look at the global supply chain of not only garment production, but lots of other uh, product production. Uh, but in this case, when it comes to the garment, uh, when it comes to the garment supply chain, we can see that there is a lot of work that still needs to be done, and yet it's a really, really huge, complicated issue that folks on the ground in countries like Bangladesh or Honduras or Pakistan or manufactures garments uh, is facing on a daily basis. So that space, that political space that gets open has organized and by the garment, bar, gar, garment workers at the factory level. Okay, they need all of these other pieces, these other levers to cre help create that political space. But right now we can see in the last few years that women garment workers have in Bangladesh are really asserting themselves both as leaders in their organizations and now in their communities. Um, I want to just read a couple of pieces from a piece I wrote last December on the occasion of International uh, Human Rights Day to the heart of Lily's work and presentation. It's been a nostrum of development economics for the past 20 plus years that merely creating garment jobs was the key to women's liberation and empowerment. True, approximately 80% of workers employed in the Bangladesh garment sector are women. True, millions of women now have independent means of earning an income, which is important to raising women's status within their family and community. However, few adherents to this economic analysis have examined whether creating low-wage jobs has truly led to women's empowerment in a way that is personal, cultural, sustaining, or lasting. Rather, many economists and political scientists view Bangladesh and the global garment supply chain through a purely free market analysis. This 
lens, through this lens, the wage, any wages at all enable women to improve their status. Yet it's much more difficult to acknowledge that the real issue is the global supply chain with which, within which women need to exert this, their power and genuinely take control of their own destinies inside and outside the home. It's a lot more complicated than just having a job. Um, you know, I would say in a country, in an industry, it's marked by the absence of the rule of law, the ability of women workers to exercise freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, organize their own democratic independent institutions, is really democracy from the ground up, and it challenges the weakness of democratic practice and rule of law at the macro level in Bangladesh as well. The challenge is certainly on and it's ongoing. Um, last year when I was in Bangladesh um, meeting with women garment workers uh, actually in the community around the Tazreen uh, disaster, this young uh, woman factory leader in her early 20s uh, said to me uh, that before the Tazreen and Rana Plaza building collapse, as she was struggling to form unions, uh, you know, a union in her factory, that people in her community, you know, uh, and her family looked at her as a troublemaker. It's like, why are you doing this? This is going to create problems. Uh, this is going to draw attention and, and tension in the community. After these disasters and after the success of these hundreds of unions that Lily referred to that have been able to organize, this woman said to me, they used to see me as a troublemaker, now they see me as a leader in the community. And I think that's real grassroots democracy both in the workplace and in the, in the society at large. Um, but also, as Lily pointed out, eh, during this period where political between 2000, 2012, 2013, 2014, um, we now see that there would be, uh, if not a complaining of this space, certainly we see down in the willingness of the Bangladesh government to recognize the efforts of these young workers organizing new unions. Uh, I think it was referred to at the end of 2014, the number of unions that have been formed and actually registered has declined. Um, under Bangladeshi law, in order to have a union where you actually negotiate have a and negotiate with employers, uh, you Set of, of uh, some regulatory regulations, list of members, so on and so forth. A threshold of 30% of the workforce in any in any factory. Many many unions are meeting those criteria, but the Joint Directorate of Labor of the Bangladesh government is refusing to register those unions, even though uh, they meet all the legal requirements. So there's concern here that this space has been open. Uh, losing somewhat, maybe getting a little more difficult for, for workers to actually organize. Um, I think this is an important thing to think about when we think back to the different levers and mechanisms, tools that can help create for workers to organize in Bangladesh. And this is something but the in the European Union and European Union governments themselves are looking at as a, as a serious issue. Um, I want to close real quickly uh, these few comments uh, with an observation using a, a sort of handy sociological analogy uh, in terms of the prospects for continued development of the Bangladesh trade union movement. Um, I don't know if study sociology, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, what people need as people to reach certain levels and then get beyond that to higher levels of self-actualization, development, and so on. You can sort of apply that to, uh, to the labor movement, not just in Bangladesh, but elsewhere in the world. There are some very basic things that have to start first when it comes to forming organizations. Um, beyond forming that organization, beyond recognition, being able to get to the point where that organization can do what it in the case of unions in, in Bangladesh, negotiate with employers and the government for better conditions. All of the issues that, uh, that Lily was talking about that affect women workers in particular. 
Bangladesh is at a stage where those unions are organized, they're becoming more professional, they want to negotiate, they want to engage, and that's one of their big challenges right now, is getting that engagement, uh, especially with the, uh, with the Bangladesh uh, garment manufacturers um, who are, uh, at this point, I think still reticent a little bit to, to engage with workers in their, in their facilities. Um, finally, when unions can create enough momentum, create enough power, create enough voice, that's when they can also begin to weigh the whole democratic process at a higher level in their countries. And it comes to higher level policy discussions and recommendations and engagement with the government and with the business community. That's where the Bangladesh union movement wants to go. It'll take a little while to get there. They've got to keep going with the progress that they've made so far and to continue. But we see a really uh, great opportunity for the Bangladesh garment unions to not only practice small d democracy, but also to really impact the situation, the rights and standard of workers, um, you know, at the and that's something that's I think really really important for them to be able to to uh, to do going forward. Um, I just oh, uh, the 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 leaders that have emerged now in the Bangladesh. Uh, Trade union movement, women workers, you know, we're not, you know, a lot, uh, you know, politicians or or uh, political uh, folks who organized from the workers who were workers in factories that came from the bottom up and have risen to the leadership of these organizations and federations. It's uh, it's a tremendous uh, accomplishment, and these are the women and the leaders that that Lily and uh, her colleagues have been working on uh, in Dhaka and are at the front line of union democracy in Bangladesh. Thank you, Tim, for those insightful and eloquent remarks. Um, it's unfortunate that it takes a tragedy like Rana Plaza or the Tazreen fashion fire to take notice of what's going on and then for it to begin to pose an opportunity for reform, but that is the reality that you articulated, Tim. And on that note, I wonder if I might um, turn to Lily to pose the first question, and then we'll open it up to the floor. Um, and the question has to do with the upsurge in the number of trade unions that were established in the wake of the Tazreen, as you had noted, that there were, I think, 300 plus plant level unions established of which um, women's leadership was more than 60%. Yes. More than 60% of these trade unions had um, women's leadership. And yet later in your presentation, you talked about how women's issues remain mind, continue to be neglected. And I wonder how you might address that apparent disparity between the upsurge in unions and women's leadership, and yet the women's issues remain sidelined. Maybe tell us what those issues are and why they Neglected. Thank you very much. The trade unions, I mentioned that 30 collective bargaining agreements already signed between women and the new registered unions. Still, some of the women issues are sidelined, and there is a need for training, training for women, for women leaders. And the issues are coming, like maternity benefit for women, maternity leave for women. But there are other issues that women realize and they need, but still, these are not in the bargaining. Pregnant women, they need more bathroom breaks than others. Very simple issues. Pregnant women, they need light work. They cannot do heavy work all the day with the machine. And there are some other issues. Like in Bangladesh, we have a day in a year. It's a polio day, we say. Polio vaccine where mothers and parents, they take their children up to year five. So they take their children 
polio vaccine. And government, if they get two, three hours off, they can take also their children to get vaccine. It's a good thing. The impact is not in union. It's the positive impact for the nation. So these are some examples. And there are other issues, many more. And union can make sure how many workers are pregnant, how many of their members have children sold, and they can arrange that, discussing, negotiating, factory management. So these are the issues to say that should be also included because the industry is based on women workers. And I would like to mention also that I mentioned and Shim Ryan mentioned union registration since the end of 2014, which is happening. And the resist applications are being rejected for various reasons, including verification of applications and union membership in presence of management, where workers cannot express their genuine support for union because of fear of losing job and other unexpected circumstances. So these are the areas really need to work. And Lily, the fact that you have in these unions over 60% women's leadership, do you feel as though that is a hopeful sign that these issues that you just articulated will be addressed? It is hopeful and very positive sign. And the union, they did that negotiation and bargaining agreement with the management. They failed, they are respected. When they discuss sitting with their management, it is a new step. And we all will help garment workers to forward them in that step. It is a very positive step. Thank you. Okay, let us turn it over to the floor. Who would like to ask the first question? And if I could ask you to identify yourself and your affiliation. Yes, Sally. Sally Blair, Senior Director, Fellowship Program. Lily, thank, thank you. A wonderful presentation. Um, Lily, would you tell us a little bit more about the women that you see rising in the ranks and becoming active? as you are there and you conduct trainings, um, what are the that you see, um, who is emerging, um, how do you see them developing their skills? Can you tell us a little bit more about the process that you nurture with these women? Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, women are developing and they are taking step and progressing. And we know the garment workers, they have a level of education. They understand they can read and write. And the issue to present, want to highlight, these are not very complicated issues. These are issues. Payment, overtime, day off, and building and Before the collapse of Rana Plaza, workers were afraid, and they also notice the cracks. And to understand seeing a crack, that this is not good, this is sorry, this is serious, they do not need a very complicated math or analysis. So they understand their issues and how they are progressing. They are taking their issues. They are talking. And I can tell the progress giving a very a, a specific example. In a number of factories, little crack or seeing some little things, workers have to work here. We are going down, we will call people, even we will call management, factory inspectors. So this, how they are empowering, how they are forwarding. Thank you very much. Mike Allen has a question, Carl Gershman has a question, and the lady behind Sally has a question. So we have, Mike, let's start with Mike. Mike Allen with the NED. In fact, I have three questions, so indulge me. Oh, my. Uh, Firstly, firstly, I wasn't clear, I may have missed it, but size percentage of uh, workplaces of those 5,000 um, that you 
are actually unionized. In other words, what percentage of workplaces are recognized, recognized unions for the purpose of collective bargaining? Within the RMG sector? Within the sector, yeah. Secondly, there was a lot of reference in your comments and Tim's comments to factory level unions, which is great, but to what extent are there efforts to develop sector or, or industry-wide unions? Because clearly, um, factory level uh, union advantages, clearly from the point of view of uh, workplace issues, but less so uh, when you talk about unions as a political actor, particularly when it comes to political leverage as well as collective bargaining leverage. And thirdly, uh, with respect to the global brands, you mentioned the, the, um, the, the, the Worker Safety Accord, which is associated with US companies. My understanding is that the, um, the, 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 the accord for uh, building safety, fire and building safety, which is associated with European companies, is a much more robust uh, code and has much more robust uh, sanctions. Furthermore, European and, for that matter, other international companies like Liam Fong in Hong Kong have been much more proactive. Um, Liam Fong, along with CNA, the European retailer, made uh, generous contributions to the Tazreen Fund, uh, Compensation Fund. Uh, Benetton, the Italian uh, company, I think uh, made over a million dollars or million euros a contribution to the uh, Rana Plaza Fund, whereas it seems that Europe uh, US rather companies have been a little less um, backward in coming forward, if I can put it that way. Um, so I wonder if, if you recognize a difference between European-based and North American brands, and if so, how you explain their difference in their responses to these tragedies? Thank you, Mike. Why don't you take a stab, and then I might turn to Tim as well to respond. So the first question was, yeah, what percent is yeah, unionized? This, we can see the percentage very easily. There are 5,000 plus garment industry in Bangladesh. Before year 2013, or if we go back like 2010, like 10 to 15 unions were active, were working. And during these two years, a good development took place in union registration. And therefore, 300 unions became registered. But if we can compare the number 300 plus, then it is very little. So percentage then can be covered up with that. And then agreement, 30 unions did agreement that I mentioned before. And factory level union, their issues and their role in national level the question you asked, if I just make it general, then our national law that support or the workers have rights under the national law, Bangladesh Labor Act 2006, to form factory level union, to be organized, to do collective bargaining, negotiation. Now, these factory level unions they are affiliated with federations and they along with federation or through the federation they also express their common issues to the national level so this is the way they are working with the federations and national level they are bringing their issues and your third question after I response, I will also Tim Ryan to response a little bit on that, that the accord and the involvement of European and Americans, et cetera. You mentioned some of the names. But if you go back the history of signing agreement, it came step by step. And also were accepted step by step. Like the global brands and retailers in one area, they recognize they will do, but workers' rights and freedom of association as the issue came to them. And the other Northern American appeals, they wanted their own accord. So these are the differences. And I mentioned that accord, it has been doing good, but not talking on union issues. 
not responding to anti-union activities, not taking union and women workers' issues, making and this is a concern. So they, do, they are doing a short-time development, which is good. And we believe and we hope that will be lo taken long term. But when accord will be out from Bangladesh, or they will end their period, who will continue? And regardless, accord or who will do that, who signed, who not signed, that's not a question. That's a need. However, fact union and giving them assistance, working with them, and the decline of registering is a question because entitlements and these are the legally binding agreements under the national and international laws. So we all can focus on that and we also can assist in the pr process. You, Tim? Sure. Yeah, um, I think, Michael, you got the sense of the percentages. It's a small amount as of now, uh, but even in the last couple of years, it's grown significantly. Hopefully that space will remain open so it can continue to grow. Uh, the Solidarity Center works with seven, seven different federations. So these federations sort of in the Maslow's hierarchy are forming and becoming more professional, um, but it's in a very, very difficult environment. Um, but those, those uh, bodies are definitely, definitely forming. Um, on the Accord versus the Alliance, um, I think, uh, you know, Lily did spell out some of the technical differences between the Accord and the Alliance in her presentation. Um, again, highlighting maybe two or three things that are significantly different between them. One, yeah, there's more than 200 brands that have signed up for the Accord as opposed to something like 26 for the Alliance. The brands in the Accord also agreed to a legally binding process to be a part of that uh, effort. And um, by virtue of the fact that you have, uh, and, and you also had, as Lily mentioned, two major international federations and local partners that were, that were signed on as part of this. So that I think Lily is right that there needs to be more, um, it, would be, it would be good if the accord would spend more time looking at uh, what happens in factories, for instance, when uh, one of their signatory factories, if workers say there's some, there's some real worker, uh, there's some real safety violations here, and bring the attention, uh, bring the attention to that factory, you know, workers are victimized just as a result of trying to help the uh, factory become more compliant. Um, there's an umbrella opportunity there for the accord to, to um, assist workers in that situation, although that's not their main mandate. And in some circumstances, they weighed in on, on behalf of workers who were essentially whistleblowers. Um, the last thing I'd say is that the, by virtue of the number of companies involved, brands involved in each of these uh, arrangements, um, the Accord has 1,700 to 1,800 factories they're looking at. The Alliance is about 600. So there, it's a factor of three in terms of the coverage of factories that can be that can be addressed by the accord compared to to the alliance thank you tim um carl has a question and then the lady behind sally has a question uh, thanks uh and congratulations lily it was great um i actually have the first to uh is really to both of you um uh and and especially tim i i, I want to know what is, is cooperation between the Solidarity Center and SIP uh, in terms of trying to get address the issues, in other words, to address the business sector as well as the labor sector on the working conditions and uh, the, the uh, you know the well-being of the uh, of the industry, and also uh, Lilia, d to what extent are you able to get cooperation uh, from the companies uh, from the private sector, and do you seek um, you know, the help of the Solidarity Center in trying to work on those types of problems. And then the, you know, the other two questions are just maybe more to Tim, um, get a sense of the global market. Uh, you know, we did have the Triangle Fire 104 years ago, which suggests very substantial garment industry in the United States, and it disappeared because 
the global competition. What percentage of the international market uh, does uh, Bangladesh now have? And do you see that market changing? Um, and where might, you know, if indeed it continues to change, um, where might the competition, um, where might the competition be? And are, is it possible to think of doing anything now uh, as workers, the women workers, especially in Bangladesh, gain capacity and skills and leadership ability to begin even to think about you know, what the transition might be to different types of industry and economy in the future, because eventually that's going to happen because it's happened everywhere else. Thank you for those questions. You want to go first? Yeah. Okay, and then we'll turn to Tim. Sure. Thank you very much, Carl. <clears throat> Companies cooperation, yes, we have been getting. And the 30 agreements between the company and management, that's a good sign that workers and many of these workers were trained by the Solidarity Center. This cooperation, for if specifically, I can mention that Solidarity Center, we have been doing fire safety training, fire and building safety training involving management and workers, where managements are notified, they are giving time their workers to come to the program. So, yes, we are getting this is a big area and so many companies. So, passion and more understanding needs to become so that the workers exercise their rights, women workers can work their rights, and company, they can also work with and run good business. Thank you, Tim. Sure. Thank you, Carl. Um, yeah, two or three important questions. One of them will take a little longer to answer than this forum, but I'll give it my best try. We have actually had conversations with SIPE um, about this situation in, in Bangladesh. Um, to be very straightforward about this, there's sort of a, at least at this point, there's been sort of a mismatch between, uh, in, not, not in a bad way, just in terms of what site focuses on in terms of building their um, program in different countries with local you know, women entrepreneurs. Uh, Salima, who I met at the, the conference in Delhi, looking uh, to, to establish some relationship with. Um, but th so there's a sort of a different, a different uh, population of employers in Bangladesh that SIPE is the that we, uh, through the work, in the garment industry, for instance, are dealing with. So there's, there's sort of, it doesn't quite match up, but we certainly had conversations about that and talked with them about the accord and the alliance. Um, SIPE being an American organization as well is closer on some level through the Chamber of Commerce to the American uh, companies, brands that are involved in the, uh, you know, in, in garment industry in different countries than the European brands who make up most of the accord, for example. Um, but yeah, we've had those discussions. Um, in terms of the global supply chain, uh, you know, uh, I believe, um, I know the number was on the presentation, uh, makes up $24 billion of foreign exchange for Bangladesh right now. Bangladesh is the number two garment manufacturer in the world now, behind China. China is actually rupturing uh, garment manufacturing jobs. Um, even companies that had been in Indonesia in the 90s and gone to China are now going back to Indonesia. Part of this, frankly speaking, is, and this is where it gets into sort of a larger, I think more complicated question, part of this gets into um, upward wage pressure. And when you begin to have higher and higher wages, and therefore, hopefully, more consumption, and you can start growing your middle class. This is a this is a, an inevitable sort of trend, which means that um, a country like Malaysia, for example, which also started out as a as a, uh, a low wage uh, manufacturing hub, has moved very aggressively now into electronics, uh, value added industry. To be very honest, and to acknowledge our our guests here from the. Bangladesh Embassy and the Bangladesh community, 
I've had these conversations fairly extensively over the last several years with various Bangladesh ambassadors and also government officials in Bangladesh to say it's, it's great to have this manufacturing industry, but you need to take a look around and see what other, what other policy and economic development uh, policies and programs that you might put in place to begin to move to other different manufacturing platforms if you're going to continue to pursue the export uh, platform uh, model. Um, just a real quick aside here. I'm not sure. I know some people in this room I probably buttonholed with this, with this uh, factoid. But um, in 1960, um, a guy uh, put together a, his master's, his MBA thesis, which was what we need to do is we need to own the brand but none of the manufacturing facilities. And what we'll do is we will offshore the manufacturing from the United States to low wage countries like Japan, South Korea, Taiwan. That was Phil Knight, the CEO of Nike. In great part, the global supply chain structure is a result of this vision of Phil Knight to basically continue to offshore uh, manufacturing to lower and lower uh, manufacturing hubs. That said, interestingly, the opportunity here to talk about the region because it's it's not just an isolation. You referred to that, in a sense. Who else is out there that is also yeah, important manufacturers? I think the the Bangladesh garment manufacturing will continue to grow. They have um, a goal of reaching, I think, 50 billion dollars by 2020. Um, at the same time. A couple, there are other emerging uh, manufacturing platforms. Vietnam, of course, has been very aggressive. And if it's covered as it, if, <laughs> I just betrayed my bias there. If it is covered under the Trade Pacific Partnership uh, Agreement, um, its, its industry stands to grow as well. We're also, I think, the international community, both in terms of business and labor, is looking at, at Burma. And there is a lot of discussion around the situation in Burma to say, OK, this is a fledgling industry there. But can we find ways to get and essentially brand Burma as a higher road approach to manufacturing? The Burmese yesterday just passed their first minimum wage bill. The minimum wage now in, Bangladesh, in Burma is $93. It's 68 in Bangladesh. So in order to go on this high road, in order to get more uh, opportunities for more other kinds of manufacturing and build a consumer society, wages absolutely have to rise. And obviously, from our perspective, unions are an important uh, way to help make that happen. Yes. Thank you for your comments. Lily and uh, Tim. Um, you, you both mentioned the If you could introduce yourself oh, as sure. well, please. Erika Weberite, International Republican Institute. You both mentioned the growing number of women in the trade union's leadership. Um, trade unions, um, if anything, th if they are anything like political parties, it's more like ticking the box than really having women ha say, uh, have a say in the decision making. How fast is that number growing? When did it grow to 60%? And really, how, how influential or impactful women are? Because if they're not sitting at the negotiation table when the wages are negotiated, then you know it doesn't make any difference whether it's 60% or 1%. And then Tim, um, Salima has been a partner of IRI for a very long time, as well as side partner. And she is one of these leading women who is the founder of Bangladesh uh, Women's Chamber of Commerce and Industry. And she really paid attention. She's one of these attention to empowering women entrepreneurs and so I'll be you're still looking into contact I'll be glad to put you in contact thank you so the first question was how fast is the number of women in trade unions growing and are they exercising any influence within the trade unions the number I mentioned 60 percent women leadership is during the period 2013 to the middle of 2014. 
and now they are doing negotiation they are talking management to the government people to inspectors and other people regarding workers issues and other needed things they need to address and how they will grow second half of the question to grow they need a space they need cooperation they need union registration like 500 factory workers became organized and 300 union received registration 90 of which no longer active 45 of that 90 were closed because of the factory closure and 45 closed because of inter-union activities by the management. So how they will grow, how fast? It depends on so many things. They want to grow, they are growing, but all other things need to be in their favor. Thank you. Um, yeah, the only, uh, you mentioned in passing the political parties. Um, I think it's worth noting uh, close observers of uh, Bangladesh uh, political and labor scenes um, would know this. It's a little bit in the weeds, but there are plenty of quote unquote trade union organizations that basically serve as fronts for political parties. Um, the Solidarity Center and the International Labor Movement don't consider these to be real organizations because they act as arms of the and not really organized either from the grassroots by workers or working in their interests. Seven federations I mentioned earlier are independent unions with no connection to any political parties and really representing workers' interests. Um, I think it's, uh, you know, I think it's really important uh, and I, I would say this is a, a general sort of nostrum of labor organizing, certainly these days, not just in the United States, but, but everywhere in the world, is coalition building is so incredibly important. Um, not only labor all working together if they can, but also working with NGOs, with other or community organizations. Um, a lot of the work that, that the Solidarity Center and its partners do in the, in the next couple of years is really looking at how to build these coalitions in the communities around the factories as well as in the factories themselves. And a critical thing that um, uh, is important for organizing labor unions in any country, including in the United States, um, seeing labor as part of a broader social justice movement uh, rather than just in a box about it's just no, it's also about all kinds of other social justice issues, I think is important and going to be important all of the labor and the whole growth and development of labor um, in Bangladesh. Lily Mingesha has a question and the gentleman in front has a question. Why don't we take those two together? Lily and Tim can respond. Okay. Um, nice. And nice present. If you could introduce yourself. It's uh, my name is Lily. I am a Regan Faso Fellow here at NED. From uh, Ethiopia. I'm from Ethiopia, yes. <laughs> uh, nice presentation, Lily. I just, uh, you, on your presentation, you mentioned the uh, growth of these unions uh, throughout the years, which is a positive sign. But I want to know how independent these unions are, how independently they operate, uh, how much. Um, uh, do they get pressure from management or from the government? And also when there are cases when they uh, bargain about uh, maybe maybe right violations with the management and they don't go through to, uh, to court and how much uh, is the court uh, um, ruling on in their favor? Do they, do they win cases? Thank you very much. So what is the question? How independent are the unions from pressures and pressures from the government. The second question, yes. and then we can respond. Yes, if you could also introduce yourself. Sam. Uh, my name is Shabir Ahmed Choudhury. I'm with the U.S. Bangladesh Advisory Council. I have two quick questions, one to Dr. Gomez. Uh, I have 
noted your concern about uh, Alliance and uh, Accord, what will happen after they uh, accomplish their mission or when they de depart Bangladesh. What is your opinion, Dr. Gomez, having uh, interacted very actively with the industry? And as you know, I represent the Bangladesh textile and uh, garment industry here in the US. I want to ask you this question for the benefit of the audience. In the recent past, have you seen a change of attitude amongst the factory owners in terms of their outlook and attitude towards union formation? My other question to you, Mr. Ram, is that uh, we are not a democratic country. I'm going to ask you a very blunt question. Are you and AFL-CIO going to support Vietnam's entry into the TPP? Thank you. That's a good blunt question. <laughs> OK. <laughs> Let's start with Lily. Yeah, to answer the question of Lily Mangesha, how independent these unions? These unions are garment workers' unions, and they are not involved in politics. They are workers. So if you see or if you check websites, you will learn more how garment workers are. And though they don't have complicated issues, very simple issues. All issues about their workplace and employment. And how support or cooperation they are getting from the government, the, your second question. They are getting support, obviously, because they received registration, the first answer. And then from owners, end of the day, they did collective bargaining agreement, which is a cooperation and achievement. But the reality, from organizing and going to get registration and get collective bargaining agreement signed, this process is not very nice and smooth. The, this road is really hard. And sometimes, suspended. in general, I am giving the answers. And they are marked. And many other resistance they have to face. But with the unions I mentioned during the last two years, this is a good sign. And we can say the unions they did collective bargaining agreement, or they are sitting with their management, they are getting cooperation. They are getting cooperation from management and government. So to answer your question, the concerns I mentioned about Alliance and Accord, they will leave what happen after that. That is a question. But regardless, my concerns. Union is the entitlement of workers. Workers have right to form freedom of, uh, right to exercise freedom of association. Whether accord is there, alliance is there, all the thing. They are assisting to make workplace safe. On the other hand, union must be there. And they can work with them because accord, alliance, government, all are helping to improve the present situation safety, and all other concerns. So if they can work together, and when accord will leave, because the accord is funded by the brands and buyers, and of course they, are, they, they have a timeline. Even if they extend their period, then what will happen? An union can learn, union can grow, union can work with them. And the practical scenario is, accord is responsive, and they are helping workers when they are terminated, for raising a safety issues. Accord brings them and assists them. But Accord is not responding when are harassed or anti-union activities takes place. So, and women leadership. So, are the concerns. So, Accord, when they will be do done their work, still union should be there to continue monitoring to continue work with the management, to run, to take the garment industry forward it. 
That's the answer. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your blunt question. <clears throat> I will give you a nuanced answer, <laughs> but it's correct. Um, I, I think it's important to make a distinction, of course, between the Solidarity Center, which is an uh, international NGO that is, you know, 501c3 in the United States, uh, does international work, sister organization of the AFL-CIO. But in this respect, we don't commentary or take positions on trade policy of the United States in that regard. Um, the AFL-CIO, on the other hand, and in this case, I can't say I'm speaking for the AFL-CIO. I would say that my understanding in discussions with them that their point of view on Vietnam is an authoritarian country. There are serious, real serious problems of freedom of association, uh, collective bargaining, and so on in Vietnam. There's no question about that. Um, I, to, to, to try to characterize the AFL-CIO's point of view, I would suggest that they recognize that all of these agreements, the free trade agreement with Jordan or with, with Singapore, with Colombia, with Central America or whatever, the WTO, these are sets of rules. These are not immutable laws of nature. These are sets of rules that are determined and negotiated between different players. Governments and very often in the room, corporations and companies where other civil society organizations such as trade unions or NGOs or environmental groups and so on are not privy or part of that conversation. So the real question is, is will there be in the TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, a set of, of seriously defined labor standards and conditionalities that countries will have to adhere to, all countries that are signatories to this trade agreement will have to adhere to in order to gain the benefits under this trade agreement. Therein lies some real questions for Vietnam's participation in, this, in the TPP. And at this point, of course, no one really knows exactly the details or what's in it, not even members of Congress, which is one of the reasons why they've had this sort of acrimonious debate about whether or not to give fast track authority to the president. Um, so the question is, is, is what do these things look like and will the part of the agreement be able to meet those standards? Malaysia is another good example of a country that has serious problems in terms of migrant labor, forced labor. Uh, it is now tier three on the US government's uh, trafficking in persons report, the lowest, uh, uh, lowest tier in terms of um, conditions uh, for migrant workers. So that's the real question uh, that I think has to be addressed. I think as the AFL-CIO is concerned that these issues are addressed for any country that's involved under the TPP. Okay, I think we have time for just one more question. Would anyone like to pose that final question? If not, I would like to do so. Um, it follows from what, Tim, you had alluded to about the education and empowerment of women in trade unions, I think you were saying, um, helps to shape, nurture the movement for democracy writ large well beyond the labor movement so that both men and women can engage in policy level discussions on issues relevant to Bangladeshi democracy, but not necessarily focusing exclusively on labor issues. And, um, Lily, you talked about how local communities should support women's involvement in trade unions. And my question to you, Lily, in conclusion, is to what extent is women's involvement in trade unions helping to open the hearts and minds of men so when these working women return to their homes and deal with domestic violence or abuse from their husbands, to what extent is the education and awareness they are gaining within the working world helping to transform the hearts and minds of the men that they interact with in other parts of their lives? If you would like to share some yeah. thoughts from that in conclusion. Yeah, this is a very important point. And the garment workers 
They support their family with their earning. They support their children. And when they become organized, I see it firstly they face problems and harassment by their management. And when a person face that, then is the harassment just something saying verbally. It's like suspense listing who are they, and also sometimes not paying these workers. So of course, it makes an impact with their family life. And Bangladeshi women are progressing. Last few years, they are promoting their voices in many other sectors and nationally. Their women leadership, gender equality, all other things I mentioned in my presentation, these are the developments workers are going back to their family that I am just harassed, suspended for this, I don't know when I'll go back, then they get also the same situation from their family. So we Solidarity Center, we started work with the family. We advocacy for family awareness. So we bring government workers and families just talk, sit down, and understand what they are doing. And this is not only the workplace issue. Social issues are also involved. When young women and men, garment workers, they go for meetings, and late evening they come back, there are many social issues and questions are involved in that cases. So family education and awareness is I think helping and will help if we can continue that. Thank you. Thank you very much. And that is a very positive note to end on. It's clear, Lily, that you are a leader, not only within the labor movement, but a pioneer of um, working women and um, a pioneer in the movement for democratization in Bangladesh. Um, I'm delighted that the Solidarity Center, Tim Ryan and others are supporting you in your important work and we look forward to continuing our support to you moving forward. Thank you all for joining us.